All right, boys and girls, I'm back for the second part of chapter eight, the only objection. So I will get right back into reading. Hope you're enjoying it. The wedding guests had all arrived and taken their seats. The musicians played a pleasant song as they waited, except for the organist who couldn't figure out why the organ wasn't working. All they needed was the bride and the wedding could begin. Froggy stood on the platform and looked quite anxious. Every second he waited made him feel made him more paranoid that Red might have had second thoughts. He was afraid that at any moment Red's handmaiden would run inside and tell the room the bride had called it off. All the royal families had come to support Froggy and Red. Froggy's brothers, King Chance, King Chase, and King Chandler gave him thumbs ups to calm his nerves. His sisters-in-law, Cinderella, Snow White, and Sleeping Beauty, blew him kisses. Queen Rapunzel sat with her long braid piled in her lap, as it had tripped all the guests seated near her. The people sitting behind Empress Elvina were upset because her giant crown made of tree branches blocked their view, but they were too afraid to ask her to remove it. Red's granny and the little old woman who managed the shoe inn sat on either side of the Empress, chatting her ears off. I've heard that elves aren't the best tailors, Granny said. You should let me come to the Alp Empire and give sewing lessons. I've made all of Red's clothes ever since she was a little girl. Her wedding dress is the best one I've ever made. At least I hope it is. I lost my glasses a few weeks ago. The fairy council was also in attendance, and Connor avoided making eye contact with them as much as possible. Unfortunately, he couldn't avoid everyone he wanted to. Weddings are so romantic, don't you think, butter boy? Connor's whole body went tense as the sound of the voice. He looked up and saw Trobella had chosen the closest possible seat to him. It reminds me of the time we almost got married, Trobella said. Remember that, butter boy? It was the best ten minutes of my life. It was a memory Connor had tried repeatedly to forget. It rings a bell. Of course, we were so young and foolish then. We weren't mature enough for marriage, Trobella said. That was only two years ago, Connor reminded her. Feels like yesterday, right? She said. I'm so glad we didn't go through with it. We needed time apart before we made that leap. We needed to live a little and have more experiences in love. Thankfully, I got all of that out of the way with Gator. May he rest in trouble in heaven. I'm sure you feel the same way about that blonde girl. You mean Bree? Connor said. You weren't dating. I haven't even talked to her in a couple months. Even though they hadn't spoken in a while, Connor would be lying if he said he didn't think about Bree often. In fact, Bree was the only thing he actually liked thinking about these days. Funny how the flames of love diminish so quickly, Trovalis said with a deep sigh. Luckily, I've learned the difference between a flame and a fire. I didn't know it at the time, but Gator was just a flame. I'm done with flames. What I need now is a fire. She looked up at Connor and batted her big eyes. Connor's stomach started to turn. He thought they were past all of this. Well, I hope you find one, Connor said, and patted her on the shoulder. Excuse me. Connor walked away from her as quickly as possible and joined Froggy on the platform. He wished Trobella had never brought up Brie. If he were honest with himself, he might admit how much he missed her, but he ignored the feeling whenever it arose, afraid it would grow if he gave it any attention. Connor was glad she wasn't around, or so he told himself. He had already exposed her to a dangerous expedition around Europe and a 200-year-old army. Wherever she was, she was much better off without him. Danger seemed to follow Connor and affect anyone associated with him. Knowing that, Connor wondered if he could ever get married himself. Would it be selfish to expose someone he loved to a life as crazy as his? Would someone willingly exchange rings with him, knowing it was a risk? Connor abruptly slapped his forehead. Rings, he whispered to himself. That's what I forgot. What's wrong? asked Jack. I left the rings in the library. Do you want me to retrieve them? No, I know right where I left them. Connor said. I'll be right back. I'm the worst best man ever. Connor rushed out of the House of Progress and made a mad dash for the castle. 
It was hard to run through the village with all the people lining the streets. The crowds began to cheer as Red rode by in a golden cage. Crap, Connor said. It's going to start. He ran as fast as he possibly could, determined to get the rings back in time. The golden carriage arrived at the house of Cyrus, and all the villagers gathered at the front steps. Red and Goldilocks were escorted out of the carriage, and the people cheered at their first glimpse of her wedding dress. Hearing the crowd outside as Red arrived was the cue for the wedding to begin. The third little pig was to officiate at the ceremony, so he took his place behind the pulpit. Jack stood on the steps of the platform just below Froggy, a promoted groomsman, until Connor came back. Where did Connor go? Froggy asked. Bathroom, Jack said. He'll be right back. Alex magically appeared in the small room inside the organ, and no one was the wiser. She was so grateful that Red had gone to such lengths. As she looked around the room, she saw the wedding was filled with people she didn't want to see, although she didn't see her brother anywhere. Goldilocks walked down the aisle and took her place across from Jack. Red appeared in the doorway in all her glory, and the room got to their feet. She moved toward the pulpit, and the doors were shut behind her. She walked so delicately, it seemed like she was floating down the aisle. Froggy felt like time stopped once he saw Red. He forgot where he was and how he had gotten there. As far as he was concerned, she was the only thing in existence. He had never seen such a beautiful sight in his life, and his big, glossy eyes became even glossier. Red had to remind herself to breathe as she walked. She couldn't believe this moment had finally come. The wedding felt absolutely perfect, and everything seemed right in the world. You may be seated, the third little pig announced when Red reached the pulpit. He gave a little opening speech, making the guests laugh a couple of times. Red and Froggy were lost in each other's eyes and didn't hear a word of it. Jack worried more as the ceremony went on. Connor was still nowhere to be found. What's wrong? Goldilocks mouthed to him. I don't have the rings. Jack mouthed back. And now it's time for the rings, the third little pig announced to the crowd. Goldilocks turned to the organ and pointed to her finger. Rings, she whispered, hoping Alex would hear her. To Jack's relief, two sparkling rings magically appeared in his hand. He gave one to Froggy and the other to Red. They were oblivious to everything but each other and had no clue anything was wrong. The quick save wasn't entirely unnoticed. Emeralda eyed the ring suspiciously. She knew Alex must have been close by. She looked around the room, searching for where she might be hiding. Get out of here, Goldilocks whispered at the organ. Alex wanted to stay for the entire ceremony, but she knew it was best to make a peaceful exit while she still could. She gazed at her friends one final time and quietly disappeared into thin air. With this ring, I thee wed. Froggy said, as he slipped the ring onto Red's finger. With this ring, I thee wed, Red said, doing the same. King Charlie Charming, do you take Red Riding Hood to be your wife and queen for as long as you both shall live? The third little pig asked. I do, Froggy said. He was so emotional, he let a ribbit slip. Do you, Red Riding Hood, take Charlie Charming as your husband and king for as long as you both shall live? I do, Red said, and even beyond that. Their hearts were flowing with, were overflowing with so much joy they could have flooded the House of Progress. There wasn't a dry eye in the room. All the observing couples held each other a little tighter. And unless there are any objections, I, hear pron I hereby pronounce you, bam! The doors burst open with a blinding flash of light. A gust of wind blew through the hall knocking over all the vases and pillars. The guests screamed and covered their heads. A horned creature entered the hall and leisurely strolled down the aisle. As it moved closer to the platform, Froggy and Red realized it wasn't an animal, but a woman. Forgive the intrusion, but I object, Marina said with a menacing smile. The room erupted into a wave of murmuring. No one knew who or what the woman was. How dare you, Froggy said. Who are you? You don't recognize me, Charlie, Marina said with a playful frown. After all we've been through together. Even though she didn't have horns herself, 
Red was about to charge the intruder. Charlie, do you know this woman? She asked. Froggy tried to remember who she might be, but couldn't recall a time their paths had crossed. I've never seen her before in my life. Identify yourself, woman. Marina cackled so loudly, the hall vibrated from the echo. Why, I'm your fiancé, she said. Your other fiancé. The entire room erupted in booing and hissing. They couldn't believe this woman had the nerve to barge into a wedding and proclaim such a distasteful lie. Everyone was outraged, except for Froggy. He became stiff as a board and turned pale green. He knew who she was after all, but he never thought he would ever lay eyes on her again. Marina, he said, you've changed. The witch was delighted to see how affected he was by her transformation. It's been a very long time, yet you're exactly how I left you. Red grabbed Froggy's hand, fearing the worst. Charlie, what is she talking about? Froggy was trembling, as if he were seeing a ghost. It's been years since I saw her, he said. She was my first love, but I was afraid of what my family would think if they found out I was courting a witch, so I ended it. She was convinced I ended it because of how she looked at the time, even though I swore it had nothing to do with her appearance. She cursed me to look like a frog, so it was my own face I would be ashamed to show them. Red felt as if she was going to be sick. The charming kings all stood at once. Guards, King Chance yelled. Seize this woman. She is a criminal. Oh, sit down, Marina said. And with a flick of her finger, each of the Charmings were compelled to sit against their will. You don't have proof I was the witch who did this to him. Although it does sound like me. Why are you here, Marina? Froggy asked. What do you want? Isn't it obvious, she said. I've decided I want you back. I've missed you so much over these years. Why else would I so rudely interrupt your wedding? Over my dead body, Red screamed, putting herself between Marina and Froggy. The witch rolled her eye. The witch rolled her eyes at the affectionate gesture. That can be easily arranged, she said. You have two options, Charlie. Come with me now and return to the life we started so long ago, or choose to stay and watch me curse your pride with a fate far worse than yours. The choice is yours. The fairy council leaped to their feet at the threat. If you even attempt to curse anyone, we will personally escort you to Pinocchio prison, Emeralda said. Relax, I haven't done anything illegal yet, Marina said. It's entirely up to Charlie. So what will it be? The hall waited with bated breath, but Froggy didn't know what to do or say. The witch had a paralyzing effect on him. Fine he said with a quivering draw. I'll go. The room gasped. Marina laughed and clapped her hands. What? Red yelled. Charlie, you can't be serious. I'm not letting you go. I have to go, darling, he said. I won't let her harm you. Red put her hands on his face and tears spilled down her own. Let her curse me. I don't care, she said. There isn't a curse in the world that would be worse than living without you. Red, she's much more powerful than she seems, he said. This is the only way I can protect you. Seize livestock with lipstick. I can handle it, Red cried. I won't let her take you away from me. I'm so sorry, my love, he said with tears of his own. I have to go. I have to. Red grabbed hold of him with all her might. Froggy kissed her forehead and forced her off of him and joined Marina in the aisle. The witch linked arms with him, and they headed to the door together. Tears were flowing out of Red's eyes like a fountain. Emeralda, do something, Red said. You can't let her do this. She hasn't done anything, Emeralda said. He's leaving of his own free will. Then someone do something, Red hysterically cried. Please, I'm begging, someone stop him. Everyone in the hall looked at one another desperately but there was nothing to be done. When no one came to the rescue, Red ran after Froggy, but
but she tripped on her dress and fell to the floor. Charlie, wait! Come back! she pleaded. Please come back! Red crawled down the aisle as she cried for him, but Froggy never looked back. He and Marina reached the door and disappeared into a puff of dark smoke. Red lay on the floor and sobbed hysterically. Goldilocks ran to her and kneeled beside her. Cinderella, Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, and Granny joined Goldilocks on the floor, but Red was beyond comforting. The charming brothers stood over her by their wives. We'll find him, Red, Chase said. We won't let this witch take our brother from us again, Chandler said. She didn't take him this time, Red cried. He left me. He left me at our wedding. Red was so devastated, she became delirious. Is this a dream, Goldie? Red asked. Please tell me this is a dream. Goldilocks had no words to comfort her. Red rested her head on Goldilocks's lap and sobbed herself to sleep. With nothing left to see and no way to help, the fairy council disappeared one at a time. The other guests took their lead and filed out of the Hall of Progress. Whatever happened to Butter Boy? Trobella said as she walked out with the others. Jack looked around the hall, but there was still no sign of him. I'm going to go find Connor, he said to Goldilocks. Something must have happened to him. He left the Hall of Progress as fast as he could. The eager crowds outside weren't aware of what had occurred, and they cheered every time someone walked out, expecting their newly married king and queen to emerge at any moment. Jack squeezed through the villagers and retraced what he assumed would have been Connor's path to retrieve the rings. He made it all the way back to the castle with no sign of him. However, as soon as Jack stepped into the library, he discovered his instincts were right. All the furniture had been knocked over and the paintings were crooked. The windows were shattered and most of the cells were broken. The floor was covered in books and glass. Connor! Jack yelled. He heard grunting and found Connor curled up in the corner. He had a black eye and a busted lip and he was clutching his stomach. Jack gently lifted him up to a seated position. Connor, what the heck happened? Jack asked. Who did this to you? He was still shaken up and had a hard time speaking. He was here, he said. Who was? Jack asked. The masked man, Connor said. When I came back for the rings, he was in the library. He was stealing books. I tried to hold him down, but he fought me off. Connor faced it, raised his arm and showed Jack a sack he was clutching tightly in his fist. He had managed to grab hold of the masked man's mask. I saw his face, Connor said. Alex was right all along. He's our dad. So that's the end of chapter eight. Boys and girls, I really hope that you're enjoying um, the read aloud and I'm so excited that I'm able to continue doing this for you and keep checking back for the next chapters.